In 2018, 1.3 million people finished a marathon in one of over 5,000 events that were held worldwide that year. From a physiological perspective, the marathon is particularly intriguing as a challenge of human performance. At the start of the race, your endocrine system releases a surge of adrenaline, which will increase your heart and respiratory rates. Your heart will have to pump three to four times the amount of blood around your body during a marathon than when you are resting. This blood and the oxygen it carries will go to where it is needed, so away from your digestive system and towards your muscles. These muscles will generate large amounts of heat, 30 to 40 times more than normal, as they repeatedly contract, propelling you forward over the 40,000 steps that you will take during the race. To control your core body temperature, blood will be shunted to the skin surface, and as you sweat, heat will be drawn away from your body. Over the entire course of the marathon, you will lose three to six liters of sweat. You will burn about 100 calories every mile, so by the time you hit mile 20, your glycogen stores will become low, and provided you haven't been taking on any extra fuel during the race, your main energy source will transition over to fat. Whereas your muscular system can only store about 2,000 calories of glucose in the form of glycogen, it has nearly 100,000 calories in its fat stores. But breaking down fat for energy is much slower than carbohydrate and relies on a different energy system. The marathon will test that too. Late in the race, the body can reach a tipping point. It can't supply oxygen to your muscles quickly enough or it may become anaerobic. Lactate forms and poisons the muscles. You might be getting too hot. Your glycogen reserves could be close to empty. You start to slow down. This, in a nutshell, is the peripheral model of fatigue, which has also been referred to as the homeostatic limitation model and the catastrophe model. In this model, fatigue during prolonged exercise can be explained due to failures of systems outside of the brain. The cardiovascular system, due to a mismatch between energy supply and depletion, because of neuromuscular fatigue or muscle trauma, due to biochemical alterations, or because of thermoregulatory failure. These systems can fail in combination or individually, and this results in sensations of tiredness and associated decrements in muscular performance and function. In other words, fatigue. Whether we are talking about failures of the cardiovascular system, of energy supply, of neuromuscular fatigue, or muscle trauma, of thermoregulation, or of biomechanics. The key to the peripheral model is that fatigue is the result of a failure in physiology. It is the limit, and it originates in the muscles or the complete inability of the brain to activate those muscles. Something has gone wrong, either with oxygen delivery, biochemistry, blood supply, or body temperature, and this impairs the athlete's ability to exercise at the same pace so they slow down. But there's a problem with this model. It can't explain the end spurt that we so often see in both elite and recreational running. A study published in 2006, analyzing the pacing patterns of almost every world record set in the men's 800 meter, mile, 5,000 and 10,000 meter races showed how for the three longer races, there is a consistent pattern. After a quick start, the record breakers settle into a steady pace until the final stages of the race. Then, even though their oxygen-starved muscles were presumably awash in a sea of fatigue-inducing metabolites, they accelerated. In all but one of the 66 world records in the 5,000 and 10,000 meters dating back to the early 1920s, the last kilometer was either the fastest of the race or the second fastest behind the opening kilometer. A similar phenomenon can be seen in the marathon too, and not just in the elites. In 2014, as part of an analysis of a massive data set containing the finish times of more than 9 million marathoners from races around the world, spanning four decades, researchers found that the distribution of finishing times looks a bit like the classic bell-shaped curve, but with a set of spikes superimposed. Around every significant time barrier, three hours, four hours, five hours, there are far more finishers than you'd expect just below the barrier and fewer than you'd expect just above. Similar but smaller spikes show up at half hour intervals 
and there are barely perceptible ripples, even at 10 minute increments. Only the brain can respond to abstract incentives like breaking four hours for an, for an arbitrary distance like 26.2 miles. This idea that it is actually the brain that determines performance in a process of anticipatory regulation was first proposed in a 1998 paper by Professor Tim Noakes. In the paper, Noakes argued that the brain acts as a central governor, regulating performance to balance all the body's physiological systems. In this model, fatigue, or the slowing of pace, is the result of this regulation, which happens before any physiological failure can occur. In contrast to the peripheral model of fatigue, the theory of anticipatory regulation posits that slowing down occurs in order to prevent true failures of the peripheral systems I talked about before, rather than in response to them. Performance is only regulated, not determined by peripheral physiology. In the central governor model, which is now more appropriately referred to as the model of anticipatory regulation, there are inputs and outputs. The inputs are provided by peripheral systems. These inputs act as afferent feedback to the brain, informing it of information like how hot it is, how sore are my muscles after yesterday's session, how much energy is available, what is the pH of the tissues, how hard is the heart working, and basically, is it safe to keep going at this pace? The brain integrates all this information and then evaluates it in the context of the exercise bout before controlling the system's outputs. Key to this evaluation is a conscious knowledge of how far the athlete has gone, how far they still have to go, and a host of other inputs or moderators. The end result of this process is the output, the efferent response, or the activation or the inhibition of muscle. The efferent response will determine the force output of the muscles, and hence the pacing strategy or end spurt. Importantly, the brain too acts as an input in this model, Certain regions in the brain communicate with other regions of certain key inputs before and during exercise. In the anticipatory regulation model, the end spurt is the result of an increase in muscle activation controlled by the brain in response to numerous inputs during exercise. It occurs because the finish line is approaching and the physiological changes are no longer deemed harmful or potentially limiting to continuous exercise. The reserve can thus be activated. This doesn't mean that fatigue and the limits of performance are simply all in the mind. If your body ran out of oxygen or its temperature went above 41 degrees, or if you did accumulate too much hydrogen in your cells, for example, these would have profound and dangerous physiological consequences. The real roots of fatigue lie in the interaction between these complex systems. Skeletal muscle fatigue is not dictated by any one of the single or absolute linear models I've talked about before. So the biology of fatigue during endurance is incredibly complex. So complex that measurement might be considered impossible. How can we study fatigue when it is the product of many complex interacting systems? What single mechanism integrates information about body temperature, oxygen levels, and fuel storage, and also responds to more subtle indicators like your mood and how much you slept last night? The answer is Borg's Rating of Perceived Exertion, or RPE, named for Swedish psychologist Gunnar Borg, who pioneered its use in the 1960s. Though there are many variations, Borg's original scale runs from 6, no effort at all, to a maximum of 20. The penultimate value, 19, is defined as very, very hard, with the numbers corresponding very roughly to your expected heart rate divided by 10. A Borg score of 13 to 14, for example, corresponds to an effort you'd call somewhat hard, which would produce a heart rate of 130 to 140 beats per minute in most people. The RPE is the conscious or verbal manifestation of the integration of both psychological and physiological cues. Moreover, this effort rating climbs gradually as body temperature increases or carbohydrate stores decrease. It doesn't just wait for the catastrophe, it anticipates it. It's the final arbiter, the only thing that matters. If the effort feels easy, you can go faster. If it feels too hard, you stop. But despite this, physiological failures can occur. While rare, people can suffer from heat stroke during the marathon, they can completely run out of ATP, their hearts can fail, and most common of all, they can become injured. That's what we'll talk about next.